Um, anyway, I appreciate you allowing uh, RES to, to come today and um, share the message a little bit about what where we're at today and what we do and in, in, in our story it's going to be really really interesting it's good it's um, um, a very tech a technology that I'm very passionate about and I think there's a, a, a good use case for it in uh, all aspects of the um, IT organization um, we're lucky that we, we we you know usually GTC does these LNLs on Thursdays but because we had Eddie who uh, is from uh, the corporate office in Netherlands uh, just about an hour away from Amsterdam. Uh, he was in town, so GTC moved it around for us, and we did it today. And um, so he's going to be doing what uh, a great whiteboard session that's very informative, high level, and he's a technical guy too, so if there's questions and so forth afterwards, um, feel free to ask him that. And then right after he gets done with that, it should take 20 to 30 minutes, we'll have Amir, who is... Uh, our West uh, sales manager here, he will actually show you how it works. So uh, it should be a good, good presentation, and hopefully uh, we'll keep your attention because it's only 30 minutes here and 20, 30 minutes with Eddie and 20 minutes with Amir. But after that, so with that said, I'll, I'll go ahead and let uh, Eddie get started and introduce himself. All right, everybody. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Eddie, Eddie van Ravenstein, uh, forget the last name, um, it's Dutch, uh, hence the funny accent uh, that I have here. Um, we're, we're going to, on a high level, look at what RES uh, software is doing uh, today. Um, my background, I've been an engineer, uh, sysadmin for, for 10 years, uh, then I joined RES as a pre-sales consultant, did that for three years. and. And finally, you know, they, they pushed me in this role of, of sales enablement, which basically means that I'm traveling around the world, you know, helping our new hires out and our new partners and, you know, do as much as evangelization as, as possible. And, uh, well, that's why I'm here today, you know, very, uh, very excited uh, about you guys. I heard a lot uh, about you from Jason, so uh, we should, should be off for a good partnership here, I think. So, um, well, let's, let's just get started. Um, so, what is RES all about and why are we there in the market space, you know, and what differentiates us then from, from the big vendors and our competition and, and, and stuff like that. So, what I like to do is I like to start with, with our mission. I'm not, I'm not going to talk forever about that, but our mission is to improve IT productivity with 10x. That's what we are here for. Right, so improving IT operational efficiency in improving IT operational productivity. That's really what we're at. So everything we make, everything we develop at RES Software is geared towards this mission, right? If it doesn't contribute to IT operational efficiency, more productivity in IT organizations, we're probably not going to build that feature. If it does help, we will, right? So, well, how did we get there and, and, and why do we talk about this, this productivity thing? Well, what RES likes to do is, is talk about the user rather than technology, right? So forget about all technology for just a second and think about the end user and, and what does the user actually need from, from us, from IT, from an IT organization? Well, they need IT services. That's what they actually are need in, in need of. And, and what are those services? Well, actually that's, that's simple. That's applications. That might be data that they need to be able to use. That might be um, uh, printers because we need to print stuff or peripherals. And what is very important for a user is that, that his, his stuff, his IT stuff is personalized for him. I like to use Word in a, in a kind of a way, and, 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 and Jason might want to use it in a different way. I, I like it black, he likes it blue, I like to add icons, he might not like to do that. So, so the piece of personalization or, or settings is very important there for an end user. And when we are able to provision a user with these services, then, and then he's, he's pretty happy with that. Then he can work, he's okay with that. So. The first challenge that we see in IT organizations is 
how do we actually get those services, right? How do we get that? Well, isn't that a call to the service desk? I need something, a printer, I need access to a file share, I need an application, I, I need something. I need to change my last name because I got married and my husband is, you know, stuff like that. I need to change my mobile phone number. If we need those services, we are calling the help desk today. And actually, if we look at 10x productivity, we don't think that's really efficient because a lot of those requests are going via the help desk and you know that's not really a smart way to do this stuff because it's slow we need to wait for somebody maybe we send an email the 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 return time is is not so not so very fast and if we compare that with the uh, uh, consumer world today you know go on your ipad what do you do when you need an, a service on your ipad you go to the app store right so it's funny in our personal life, in our private life, we can order services on the fly just like that. And actually in the, in the, in the corporate environment, we still have to wait for IT to respond to me. Yeah, we, we are going to the service desk and then people are doing stuff there. And then, you know, at some point in time, maybe after a few hours or after a few days or maybe even weeks, we get our services that we want. So how could we do that better? Well, why don't we create an app store for our end users so that they can interact with IT in the same way as they do um, in their private life. That would be awesome. So let's talk about that. So is then an app store good enough? And, and that's the first differentiation between a, an enterprise app store and a consumer app store. Because I don't think we should talk about an app store because you know the application delivery part, we already got that done. Now, what is really important is to talk about an IT store. An IT store where users can find all the services that they need. And what is then the differentiation between an, an app store, a corporate app store, an enterprise app store, and a consumer uh, app store? Well, first thing I already mentioned, this is beyond, beyond apps. This app store should be able to hold any IT service right and the second thing is this IT store should not show all the IT services that we as an organization deliver because we deliver services for finance we deliver services for I don't know marketing operations there's all kinds of departments and this IT store needs to be personalized that's that's a second the second differentiator if you and I are going to the App Store, we both see the same services in there, right? To the, to the consumer App Store. All the thousands of applications are in there. I don't want to bother my users with services that are, you know, not even applicable for them. So we need to be able to personalize this IT store, and we need to do that based on organizational context. And with that, I mean, you know, your department, your role, uh, maybe your, your default location or something maybe the project group that you're a member of and that's what we do with personalization so I only see those services that I actually qualify for and that I'm allowed to request so here's the the third one IT store should not only be about delivery of services it should also be about return of services because a lot of solutions out there are really geared towards delivery 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 of IT stuff and and here's the story of that guy that is in this company for 20 years and this guy is um, changing roles over 20 years and what has happened with his access to IT services that, that grew over the years. And he has access to services that he's not using anymore. He might even have access to services uh, that he's not entitled anymore. So we run into compliance challenges there. So an IT store should be about subscription to IT services. Subscription to IT services. What do I mean with that? Well, I can deliver services, but if I don't qualify anymore, I get a new role, I get promoted to account manager. I'm not sure if that's a promotion, but um, 
right? But I mean, when I get promoted as a pre-sales consultant to account manager, I don't, I don't need VMware Workstation anymore because I don't have to do demos anymore, right? There's some exceptions there, but as an example, so that service should automatically be returned then so that this license is freed up so that we are compliant again, et cetera, et cetera. And the delivery and the return, and that's immediately the fifth differentiation with a consumer app store, we need workflows. We need comprehensive workflow capabilities to deliver services because maybe somebody needs to give an approval or maybe somebody needs, an, needs to be sent an email or, you know, there could be all kinds of stuff. But the, I, the help desk is taking care of a lot of administrative tasks around the delivery of IT services. And we should be able to automate that. And that's what we can do with delivery and return workflows. So the last big differentiator, which is very important, um, is that an app store, the Apple app store, the Google marketplace, the Windows marketplace, they deliver services on one platform only. Now, I appreciate that very much, but you guys are all getting into customers and those customers have, have huge hybrid infrastructures, right? So we should be able to deliver IT services not only on an Apple or on a, on a Windows device, we should be able to, to deliver services across our hybrid infrastructure. That means on Linux and Unix, AIX, Windows, uh, um, SQL databases, uh, uh, Active Directory. You need to be able to target your infrastructure. So it needs to be multi-platform. So that's for the IT store so far. So what happens when, you know, somebody calls the service desk, uh, now we put it into the IT store maybe, and then we have all this, uh, this administrative process and there's a ticket in the ticketing system. What happens then? You know, somebody has to pick up that ticket and somebody has to execute, you know, the ticket in the infrastructure. We need to do a change. If we want to talk about ITIL, somebody needs to, perform a standard change in the IT infrastructure. And that's happening here, because here, here is our infrastructure. And somebody needs to do something to deliver the change that is requested at the service desk or at the IT store. That's all great. Here's the task. You know what's funny about this task? I mean, it's repetitive. Because when I need something and Jason needs the same thing tomorrow, then somebody's going to perform the exact same task, right? If I need physio today and, and Jason needs it tomorrow, I don't know what needs to happen here. Maybe somebody needs to install it on my laptop or somebody um, uh, needs to uh, put me in an active directory group but we have to do something in that infrastructure. If I need my phone number changed because I got a new package deal with a new phone number, you know, somebody needs to go into that infrastructure and change that phone number for me so that it reflects in all our systems. Now, these repetitive tasks here, take up a lot of time of IT admins. Smart guys out there that are spending time, maybe we should say wasting time on repetitive infrastructure. And when I talk to IT managers, for example, they say, well, my guys are always firefighting. That's what this is. This is firefighting. And the result of that is that we need a lot of people. Those people don't have time for the strategic innovative projects that we have in the business. And, you know, we are not seen as a high quality IT organization, but we're perceived as, you know, not so good. A lot of IT managers and, and CIOs are struggling with this. So we have a very simple answer to that, and that's automation. If that task is repetitive and the outcome is predictable, why don't we automate that stuff, right? So we need an automation layer and that automation layer needs to be as a kind of a blanket on top of your hybrid infrastructure, right? And it needs to be able to target all elements of that infrastructure. 
right? <laughs> yeah, we might have SCCM in place already here. So if we gotta do something with, with software delivery, we should target SCCM. If we need to create a user account on, on our Linux systems, then we should be able to do that. So what is very important if we're talking about automation and a layer of automation is integration here. Integration with infrastructure components is key to be able to deliver those repetitive tasks automatically. Right? And that automation layer should leverage your current infrastructure. Sometimes our customers ask me like, Eddie, um, what about SCCM? Can I then replace SCCM with this or so? Well, you know, you, you could do that, but why would you? If SCCM is in place and it runs fine, does it contribute to 10x productivity to swap it out? I don't think so. We should look at the low hanging fruit. We should look at what is happening on the service desk and start picking the top five or top 10 most repeatable tasks and start automating them and putting them in the IT store. And then stuff gets delivered full, fully automatically in that infrastructure um, with a workflow. And there's a few advantages there. If I start automating, my amount of errors are going down. I mean, we're all people. I made my mistakes in my life as, as an IT admin, right? Sometimes that just happens. So errors are going down. I don't need admin rights everywhere anymore in my infrastructure. So what I could potentially do is delegate stuff away and make our current people more effective by performing those uh, tasks where they normally should have admin rights for, um, and, and that becomes less. So better security basically. And compliancy, because that, admin, that, or that automation layer knows what is going on. We know who targeted which services, etc. So when an auditor comes in and says, hey, who actually um, approved that, that access to that service, right? I can just get those reports out of the system and just tells me who approved what at a given moment in time. That really helps from a compliance perspective. Uh, do we have more? Yeah, of course we have more. We can now start focusing on strategic IT. Because I'm not firefighting anymore, because I automated all that, you know, mundane stuff away, and I can be more productive a, as an IT admin um, for my company, because now I have time for my strategic projects. Now I can be busy with the next version of whatever solution uh, we might be needing in, within our company, right? So, requesting the services in the IT store, get them fully delivered into what? Where do we actually deliver IT services? Well, that's the workspace. Also known as the desktop, right? That's where those services are actually being consumed. Now, the desktop is also a funny thing, and, and you might recognize this story. Um, well, let's see if that's, that's the thing. So, desktop, we prefer not to talk about the desktop, because desktop is kind of the PC thing under your desk, right? We, we prefer to talk about a workspace. And in our larger companies around, that workspace is hosted also in that hybrid infrastructure. Maybe still PCs, maybe a good bunch of laptops, but also VDI, also terminal services. And how am I going to make sure that this user has a consistent and personalized experience within his workspace across this hybrid uh, platform? Well, that's where we come in with something that we call workspace management. And workspace management is all about delivering the IT services in the right way. Now, traditionally, we deliver those IT services in a desktop based on who you are, right? Identity, that's basically also what, what the IT store is using to qualify for services. But in our current life, in our mobility life, identity alone is not enough anymore to give access to services. 
because my identity doesn't change, but my location does change. And based on my location change, I might need a different set of printers. Or I might need uh, applications uh, to be delivered differently. Or maybe some applications are not even allowed. I can imagine that when you're, uh, when you're the doctor and you're working in a hospital, you have access to the electronic healthcare uh, patient record. Uh, what about this guy now being able to connect from his home office via his iPad you know, to his virtual desktop? Um, is, is that application then still allowed to be used in such a situation? I don't have the answer. I don't know the rules around that. But I know that we need to be sure that we can, you know, comply to the rules when there's location involved. Same goes for device. Is an iPad so secure when connecting to certain services? I don't know. It's up to you and the customers to decide that. But we need to be able to deliver a solution that can manage those compliance um, prerequisites. And the last one is time. You know, it's funny, when I worked in IT um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, we were able to, uh, after 7 o'clock, we shut down all the servers, we started upgrading that stuff, you know, all good. Uh, that's not possible anymore today. People are working 24-7. People need to be able to get access to their services 24-7. So what about the maintenance windows? And in, in maintenance windows, people still try to connect to those applications, to those services, and they get this is nasty errors that they get, SQL bloop error, right? So how are we going to focus on that? Well, you need to be able to disallow access based on time to that application to cover that kind of stuff. And then we need to be able to put the right security around it, wrap around the right security in that workspace. And with traditional windows, um, there's not much choice there. It's either you're, administrator, you're in a local administrator or you're not. So either it's closed or it's open. And something in between, I mean, that can be done, but let's be honest, it's not really easy with, with standard windows. So you need to be able to give very granular access when we talk about security. Um, what do I mean with that? Now, for example, um, I need for a certain application uh, administrative rights. Does that mean that I give the whole session administrative rights? No, then we would elevate the access rights for that application to administrative. And we would not do that for the whole session, right? And in that way, you can have very granular security within your workspace. And that's basically what RES stands for. Now, what are the products here? Of course, we have, uh, where's my... We got here the workspace manager. And you've probably heard about Absence. Uh, that's one of our main competitors in the in the space. And if you've heard about Absence and you know what they're doing, then this is a, a quite familiar story probably. This is this is an equivalent of uh, Absence desktop environment uh, management suite, desktop now. But on top of that is uh, from ARIA software, do we have the IT store here? That's our second offering. And the third offering is an automation manager. So if we have this in place, if we have a setup like this, what we actually have done is that we really separated the user from the underlying hybrid infrastructure. And why is that so good and why is that so important? Because this user wants a consistent and personal you know, way of working. He wants a consistent way of communicating and interacting with IT. He wants a consistent but personalized experience while working with his services. So that's all good. We did that. This workspace manager builds a workspace regardless of whatever technology is underneath, whether it's Windows XP or Windows 7 or Windows 8, whether it's VDI, whether applications are streamed. The user just doesn't know and he doesn't care. Now, 
consistent access to service desk, consistent access to um, the workspace. And what about IT? What do we want as, as IT people? Well, we like to be very flexible here. Because those guys, they're asking new stuff from us every single day. And we need to be able to implement that as, as fast as we can. Right? So we need to be flexible here. We also, also what we like as, as IT people, we need to be standardized. Because that makes my life so much easier. If I can just deploy a single image, that makes my life much easier than when I need to deploy multiple images, right? So standardization really helps us to manage that environment much better. However, look at what flexible standardization is saying opposed to personalization and consistency. That's fighting to, with each other. And that's why a lot of IT operations are just struggling on a daily basis. And that's why they are firefighting. So if we now have given this user this personalized you know, access to IT services, and this layer is completely separated from the underlying infrastructure, and we have automation in between with integration, that's actually a great solution. Because if I want to swap from Windows XP to Windows 7 now, you know, we're good. We have desktop, the workspace manager, and the workspace manager will just build that workspace on Win 7, just, just as we needed it. Um, users not impacted, and we are flexible enough to change. Um, same thing, our images can be very standardized. Workspace manager will take care of the personalization of, of such an image. Uh, but also when it comes to requesting services, let's assume that we, um, I don't know, we, we, we have to do something in the infrastructure and, you know, due to progression in our data center and new stuff and cloud coming up, suddenly we host stuff somewhere else. Well, users not impacted because that service is still in the IT store we probably have to adapt the automated task one time and then it will go through like it always used to do. So standardization and flexibility on the IT side, personalization and consistency, and that leads to 10x productivity. And that is basically my story so far. So I'm, I'm not sure. Are we going to do questions first? I don't know where Jason is. He ran off. First demonstration, and then we then we go to uh, to questions. Super. All right. Well, thank you for your attention, guys. So I want to thank everyone for uh, coming in today. I really appreciate uh, taking the time and letting you come out and have lunch with us. Um, what I'm hoping to do is <coughs> kind of give you an example of the the ten X of what um, Eddie's been talking about. The actual delivery of automating and ensuring people get those services um, in an automated dynamic fashion. So what we're hoping to do is, is kind of take you through the story of, you know, what happens when I'm a new user starting a new company? Um, what does IT do for me? The, not the traditional way of, you know, five day of notice, but actually the RES way of onboarding and delivering a workspace to that user. But before I do, I want to show the, uh, I want to bring you back. <laughs> I want to show you the environment that I'm uh, currently demonstrating. I have uh, four virtual machines here. Um, the first virtual machine is basically a 2008 uh, R2. Um, it has a SQL server on it. It has my domain controller. It basically gives me the ability to, to demonstrate the technology. I also have my consoles just to show you the, the difference of the environment. The console can literally sit anywhere. To give you a little background of the infrastructure, it's very simple infrastructure. All we require is an is a agent sitting on the endpoint doing what you want it to do and a SQL database, and the database basically holds the configuration file and tells the agent what to do. Um, <clears throat> I also have an app server here, which is a Zen app server. It has an Exchange server. It's a Windows 2008 as well. And I just want to show you the, the full experience of that new user, not just with a desktop, but also uh, a Citrix environment if they're working from home, and, and show you that we're also dynamically and automatically delivering what that person's service needs for them to be productive, not only for you, but the, for them to be productive. I also have a Windows XP machine, which I'm going to log in here in a minute or two. Um, but I'm going to log in with that new user. And then I have a Windows 7 machine here that I'm going to log in right now just to show you the environment. But the reason why I want to show you is, you know, based on who the user is, they get their 
desktop, their workspace dynamically. And what I want to show first is right now I have the agent turned off and I'm logged in here as a Mirzar Sanj. Just by itself, we're not doing anything special except mapping a drive for a mirror um, from Active Directory. I don't have any special printers that are mapped to that environment. And I don't have any, uh, I have all the applications. This Basically, this image has everything that I need or more than I need, really, because I have a access in here. As you can see, I have Adobe in here. <clears throat> but I'm going to log off here for a second. And I'm going to onboard Jason. Jason just threw an RES. So I'm going to go to my, minimize this, to my IT store. So new user comes on board. They basically want to, and we'll come back and show you all the differences. They basically, um, I'm hiring Jason. Get this over here. And I'm going to onboard my new user by going to my IT store and selecting my services that are made available. Based on my context, I've actually logged in here as a Mirzar Sanj. It gives me the different services, and I'll, we'll go back in a minute, and we're going to choose Jason. And give him his telephone number, and this is just basic information. And we've already created a profile for different types of sales employees. And this time, we're going to make Jason the channel manager. Well, you know, we'll make him my boss. How's that? Jason, you want to be my boss today? Usually act as if you're my boss. <laughs> so <clears throat> now our system actually goes through the process of onboarding. Now, if you think back, the tr you know your traditional methods of onboarding a new user, how many days does it take? How many hours does it take? What are the simple tasks that are associated with that? All of those, those repetitive tasks can now be automated automatically to deliver that for the users. And, and when we talk about the IT store, don't think of it just for the administrators. But we also talk about it for the users themselves. I need to change my last name. Just like how Eddie said, my wife just got married. She's joining the company. She married me, and she needs to change her last name. Or I need to change my telephone number. Those repetitive single tasks take anywhere between two to three minutes to two to three hours to do. Now they take literally seconds because with our automation manager, those jobs that are repetitive are just simply done through automation, where the entire user that can take days can take literally seconds. And then once that user, based, you know, based on that profile that we create, when they log into that environment, they get all of their services. And you'll see in about uh, 30 more seconds that I'm able to log into the system. You'll see that I have a completely different environment. And let me go back to that system real quick and turn on the agent. So when I do log in as Jason, and, it, and just to, to show you some of the other services, multiple things you can do, resetting passwords, Simple stuff, changing telephone numbers, providing USB connections, all of this can be easily automated, provided to the users, and provided to them across the different devices. Here's Jay Pollock has been onboarded. We're going to go back to this machine here, log in, switch the user this time, give him his default password, <clears throat> and the system goes in and logs him in for the first time. I'm going to do the same for the Windows machine. and for my Xanup environment as well. Now, the, <clears throat> the nice part about it is when the user logs in, they're going to get the, the profile that I've defined to them. Jason's part of the sales, so we're going to make him sales. Give him everything that he needs to be productive, all his applications, all his printers, all his settings, all going to be configured for them down to the, even the start menu based on, you know, his profile or what we define him to be part of the sales. Now, if you notice, my entire environment's changed. It doesn't look like it was where it was a minute ago when I logged in with the agent turned off as myself. I have a set of different applications. I have a start menu that's much more different. Certain applications are actually hidden. Access is no longer there. Um, I don't have Adobe. If I go to my share drives, I now have the, the Active Directory drive that's mapped by Active Directory, but I have two additional drives. Based on who I am, I my uh, definition of being sales, I get the sales drive and the software drive. And if I go to my printers, you'll see that I automatically, dynamically receive the printer on the campus second floor. Now, the nice part about it, I want you to remember this floor, the, the name of this printer, because as I move, if I dynamically move from location to lo location, we detect who that user is and ensure that they get that services, that printer that's specifically for them based on their contacts. Now, 
we control not only the start menu, not only the printers, but even the, the shortcuts that users have. So if a user, you know, based on who they are, if they delete a shortcut, if they simply refresh their workspace or the administrator refreshes their workspace, will recognize that they don't have the proper shortcuts available to them, and it puts it right back where it was before. So not only is it the printers, but it's the entire workspace environment, and including the applications. You know, based on the type of application, we can even configure the application for that user. Um, I've created a configuration that says, when I launch my CRM application, I want to map a drive and create a ODBC connection for that application. And I want that ODBC connection to be the nearest SQL server rather than the one that's at the central location. As soon as I launch my CRM application, you'll see that it maps my CRM drive for me and my o ODBC connection is automatically con configured for me. So it's not only the workspace, it's the applications, it's the user, um, it's everything that I need, those services to be productive. On top of that, if I come in and let's say launch an application, customize that application, or rather I'll use Eddie's example of I like my background black, make a little small adjustment to that, and also say Amir was here, add that to the dictionary. I simply shut down the application. I don't need to log in or log off. I can go to my other workspaces. I can literally <clears throat> drive from the office, go home, go to my Zen app environment, start my Zen app, and basically not even logging in and logging off. You'll notice that I start my Word, I double click, and my settings all follow me from my Zen app environment, from my Windows 7 to my new Zen app environment where I'm working from home. And the system determines and detects my context, who I am, and recognizes I'm no longer working in the office and delivers the proper uh, printers for me on the fly. As it launches, I apologize, still running a little slower than expected. See, it actually detected I'm no longer a part of the, the uh, office and says, oh, your default printer's been changed. My settings are all here. Amir was here. My dictionary is there as well. And now the nice part about it, I can make additional changes. Add that to the dictionary. Make uh, this from blue to silver. Select OK. And adjust this a little bit more. Close it down. Not save it again. This time, I'm no longer at home. I've taken a flight. I've gone to the New York office, and I forgot my laptop. So they're going to give me some kiosk machine that I'm not used to, which is my Windows XP machine. And once again, I just simply log into that kiosk machine, have all the necessary applications for me, and... <clears throat> start Word, and you'll see, once again, everything followed me. Oh, I misspelled Amir. Apologize. There we go. <laughs> so that's the nice part about it. Is it's based on that context. We deliver what the users need, that productivity, the services that then they need to be productive. And it could be multiple things from configuration of the application, the, the shortcuts, the start menu. Um, it could even be down to um, the, the type of applications that are in their, their start menu from, you know, based on their context. Like if I need an application when I'm in this location, I get this application. If I'm in this office, I get that. So I've created a rule right now that says, if you notice, I don't have Adobe installed. Well, it is actually installed. It's not made available. But that's because I'm in the Windows 7 environment. I've created a policy, and we're going to come back to this in a minute, that says if the user is running Windows XP or Windows 8, they can have Adobe. But we want to go ahead and change that. We want to say if the user is running Windows 7 as well, they get Adobe too. Now, the nice part about this, you know, with a lot of our competitors, in order to make things available to the users, they have to actually log off and log in. We don't need that. We control the entire workspace. So I just simply either refresh my workspace manually or I can do it through the console itself, and it recognizes my context. It says, hey, you have Windows 7. Here's Adobe for you. So therefore, I get what I need dynamically. Now, <clears throat> what if I need an application that's not available to me? What if uh, it's not based on context? And that's where... The nice part of our IT store comes in, where we can actually see what the services that are available for my user, and based on, once again, my contacts, I need 
Microsoft Access. So I can make those requests through that IT store, or better yet, I need Mozilla Firefox. Now, mind you, it's not automatically delivered to that user. We, ha we can create uh, workflows where there's change involved, where there's um, approval process, where an administrator or that person's manager or anyone, finance, who controls the licensing can come in and say, you know what, let's go ahead and allow Amir to have those applications. Let's go ahead and give him access as well. And in the background, those applications are automatically delivered to those users, either um, available, made available by refreshing it or actually delivered and installed on that user's application. There's my access and there's my Firefox. And just don't think of this, these deliveries as just applications. Think of all the other services that are just simple for the users, like I'm going to go ahead and open up Outlook. Now, once again, this is my first time logging into this machine. It also detected my printer again once I opened up Outlook, and it says, oh, we're going to change it again. And if you notice here, it also configured my signature. But oops, my telephone number is wrong. And I need to be part of the, since I'm a sales uh, director of sales, I need to know exactly what's going on with engineering. But if I check, I'm not part of the uh, engineering, only the administrator is. So when I send this, it only goes to the administrator. Well, I need to be part of the administrative uh, I need to be part of that distribution list, and I need to change my telephone number. So once again, those services that are redundant, the simple tasks that take a few minutes, the users can come in and actually provision themselves, like changing their telephone number or being part of a distribution group where they can make that request. I want to be part of the engineering team. I'm going to close this down real quick. And that approval process, once Again, built into the system where that manager or the person who owns the exchange, Jason wants it. We're going to go ahead and allow that for that user. And in the background, <clears throat> I need to add my new telephone number because they made a mistake. Six one. And then it actually goes off and goes through the, the workflow, those simple tasks of changing the telephone number on someone. What are the specific t uh, steps that are needed to do that? And does that in the background rather than opening up a ticket with your desktop support team or picking up the phone and calling desktop support. And I simply go back to my system and it delivers that service once again automatically for that user and dynamically changes it in the background uh, my phone number within Exchange, Active Directory, wherever I've defined. I'm going to refresh my workspace. I go back. I start Outlook again. Too many clicks. I apologize. There we go. Now I'm part of the distribution list. I'm going to go here, open up my you'll see that now my signature has been changed, pulling it from Active Directory, and I am part of that distribution group. So the nice part about it is we control the entire workspace, ensure that they dynamically get everything that that user needs, the services that are associated to them, and the services that are available for them on the IT store, even if they don't need it. And it's all done, you know, we'll briefly spend, I know we're coming close to the time, and I want to save some time for questions and answers, uh, Q&A, but it's all done based on the user's context. We have a lot of different variables that we can base the context. And those rules can be anything from Active Directory location, the computer, the uh, IP address, the hardware type, where we can actually specify if it's a physical machine, give them these type of applications. If it's a virtual, if it's a WICE terminal, if they're using an actual WICE terminal, give them these applications, give them these settings, give them these services, types of configuration on the machine, even down to the Citrix clients, where we can say, you know, we have a lot of workers coming in from their mobile devices, based, you know, if they're using an Apple um, iOS, well, we know we don't like using Android on the iOS, so we won't allow them to access their virtual desktop or uh, their virtual applications from that iOS. So we can actually control how everything is done based on these contexts. And we have a, a very rich um, uh, variable, very rich data set of contexts that you can use 
to deliver those services for the users. And once those contexts are defined, you just simply define the applications. And, and the really nice part about this is we can define the start menu, go into each application, and define you know, what are the file types associated to it? What is the licensing? How many licenses do we have on that application? Who gets access to those applications, even down to the time frame? You know, based on that specific time, that user gets those applications. You know, what are the printers associated for this user? What are the, the, the drives, the, uh, uh, the folder redirect synchronization? We can do all of that based on that user to ensure that they get everything that they need. So we're controlling that entire workspace and dynamically delivering everything the users need. So with that said, I don't want to go too long. We have about five minutes for questions and answers. I'm sorry. Um, should we show the, the new I the, the new IT store? Slide. Just the slide. It's up to you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we good? Yeah, we're good. Thank we, you we very can, much. We can, we can talk about it. So, so can, can you bring up that uh, IT store again, uh, uh, Amir? Yeah. Okay. Well, any anyhow, what we are currently doing, we have seen we have seen that IT store. We have seen where where Amir is requesting services. Um, we will be launching uh, the next version of of IT store uh, coming February, and that will be really fully IT store experience for an end user, because we we have thought about things uh, from a product development perspective, and we don't think that this is this is really App Store experience, right? And we will come out with our new version. Um, and, 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 and once we go forward as a partnership, Jason, I think, and, and the Asian place, we can at, at some point also show them. So, so that's, that's for it. But actually what, what I wanted to emphasize on, what Amir just, you know, has shown us in, in like 20, 20 minutes, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff out of a user life cycle where normally, IT is involved, you know, with requests, with stuff that needs to be changed, and and he he requested a lot of services, and and it all got delivered in in those 20 minutes today. And I appreciate that, of course, Amir's environment and, and also my demo environment on my rig are very, you know, simplified versions of the truth. But the power is really in, you know, those three com components working together and delivering IT services in a very context-aware way to to the end user. That empowers the end user, but it definitely also empowers uh, uh, the IT organization to be much more productive and you know save a lot of money, save a lot of time, and and you know have that time and money available for more strategic uh, initiatives rather than the firefighting that we do all day. So, any questions? Any questions? Mission manager and the IT store, that's all part of that, what you were just showing, that console? Yeah, especially the console is working on that. And it's easier to control it. Oh, what is the back end? What do you have on the back end for that? Um, that's an instruction, the uh, SQL server. Okay. I'm just going to... Yes, you could get away with just a SQL server. The automation requires some connectors that will, and dispatchers, but those can be on existing infrastructure. Any other questions? There we go. How does it handle like high availability or PR? Uh, oh. Wait, that's. Um, that's can you? Can you how much? Thank you. 